Welcome to the third session in the ICU curriculum. This session will cover acute respiratory failure. In this session, we will define hypoxemic and hypercapnic respiratory failure and provide examples of each form of respiratory distress, identify which groups of patients with respiratory failure benefit from non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, identify common reasons for intubation and mechanical ventilation, and finally, define the four major variables that can be controlled on the ventilator and how they relate to oxygenation and ventilation. Let's start with a case. Your team picks up a new admission in the morning. The patient is a 55-year-old man with COPD who initially presented with dyspnea. His initial oxygen saturation was 72% on room air, and he required 3 liters nasal cannula to maintain an oxygen saturation of greater than 90%. Chest x-ray showed no focal consolidation or opacities. His respiratory viral panel returned positive for rhinovirus. While you are pre-rounding, the nurse calls to tell you that the patient is working harder to breathe, more tired appearing, and requiring 10 liters nasal cannula to maintain an oxygen saturation greater than 90%. You transfer the patient to the MICU for further management. His ABG on 10 liters nasal cannula on arrival to the MICU shows a pH of 7.15, PCO2 of 65, and PO2 of 52. How would you classify this patient's respiratory distress? And more importantly, what form of respiratory support should he receive, and how do we go about making this decision? In this session, we want to help you define the type of respiratory failure, understand which patients benefit from which forms of respiratory support, and recognize when intubation may be necessary. First, we need to define the two major types of respiratory failure. We will use the diagram in the center of the screen to help us throughout the session. The two major types of acute respiratory failure are hypoxemic respiratory failure, also known as type 1 respiratory failure, and hypercapnic respiratory failure, known as type 2 respiratory failure. Hypoxemic respiratory failure is a problem of oxygenation and is defined as an oxygen saturation less than 90% or PaO2 less than 60 mm of mercury on room air. Hypercapnic respiratory failure is a problem of ventilation and is defined as a PaCO2 greater than 45 mm of mercury plus an accompanying respiratory acidosis or pH less than 7.35. Now, let's talk about both in more detail. First, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. As previously stated, hypoxemic respiratory failure is defined by an oxygen saturation less than 90% or PaO2 less than 60 mm of mercury on room air. Recall that there are five major causes of hypoxemia. Low inspired oxygen, hypoventilation or decreased minute ventilation, diffusion restriction, shunt, and VQ mismatch. In the ICU, the vast majority of causes of hypoxemia are due to VQ mismatch. What is VQ mismatch? VQ mismatch is a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion in the lung. In the case of hypoxemia, blood is moving through the pulmonary capillaries without picking up enough oxygen from the alveoli. This is opposed to shunt, in which blood is moving from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart without picking up any oxygen. VQ mismatch is often due to pathology resulting in alveolar or airspace filling. Basically, the alveoli fill with something that pushes out or impairs the usual movement of oxygen. Then, the capillaries and red blood cells traversing those alveoli are unable to pick up as much oxygen as usual. This leads to more deoxygenated blood making its way to the left side of the heart, and therefore out into the systemic circulation. This creates hypoxemia. An easy way, then, to construct a differential for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure is to go through the various things that can fill an alveolus. The three most common causes are blood, pus, and water. Blood can be the result of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage due to any number of causes, like a vasculitis, bland hemorrhage from anticoagulation, infection, or a drug. Pus can be the result of pneumonia, bacterial, viral, or fungal, or ARDS. Water represents cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or another manifestation of ARDS. Additional less common alveolar filling processes include cells, eosinophils, lymphocytes or cancer, protein, a disease called pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, fat or lipid, a disease called lipoid pneumonia, and calcium, a rare entity called pulmonary calcinosis. Finally, pulmonary embolism also results in hypoxemia via VQ mismatch. In this case, there is ventilation but no perfusion. Hypoxemic respiratory failure is best treated with nasal cannula, non-rebreather, heated high-flow nasal cannula, or invasive mechanical ventilation. Next, we transition to acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. As a reminder, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure is defined by a PCO2 greater than 45 mm of mercury plus an accompanying respiratory acidosis. If hypercapnia is severe enough, it will ultimately result in hypoxemia. Referring back to the five major causes of hypoxemia, hypercapnic respiratory failure is due to hypoventilation or decreased minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is equal to the tidal volume multiplied by the respiratory rate. Therefore, decreasing either the tidal volume or the respiratory rate will decrease the minute ventilation. Ventilation is how our body controls the level of carbon dioxide in the blood. 
Therefore, as the minute ventilation decreases, the PCO2 will increase and the pH will decrease. When constructing a differential diagnosis for acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, it is easiest to think about pathology that causes either a decrease in the tidal volume, respiratory rate, or both. A good way to think about this is the won't breathe, can't breathe, and can't breathe enough schema. This schema breaks down hypercapnic respiratory failure into CNS, neuromuscular, and pulmonary etiologies. Won't breathe represents central causes of hypercapnic respiratory failure. The mechanism is a decrease in the respiratory rate. The best examples are sedative and narcotic overdoses. Can't breathe represents neuromuscular or diaphragmatic dysfunction. In this scenario, the patient is unable to activate the muscles of the diaphragm and chest wall and therefore cannot expand the lungs and get sufficient tidal volumes. Causes of neuromuscular dysfunction include Guillain-Barre, myasthenia gravis, botulism, and polio. Finally, can't breathe enough represents the pulmonary causes of hypercapnic respiratory failure. This category is defined by impaired gas exchange with overwhelmed respiratory mechanics. The two most common causes are COPD and asthma exacerbations. But why do COPD and asthma exacerbations cause hypercapnic respiratory failure? COPD exacerbations start with dynamic hyperinflation triggered by infection, medication noncompliance, PE, etc. Dynamic hyperinflation leads to air trapping within the lung. As air is trapped, the lungs expand close to the total lung capacity. Lung expansion causes diaphragmatic flattening. As the diaphragm flattens and the lungs expand, more effort is required to expand the lungs further and contract the diaphragm more. Increased effort in hyperexpanded lungs will lead to smaller tidal volumes. Recall the minute ventilation equation from earlier in the session. Smaller tidal volumes will cause the PCO2 to increase and the pH to decrease. In addition, smaller tidal volumes will only make the dynamic hyperinflation worse. This is the vicious cycle of COPD and asthma exacerbations. For a good way to represent this physically, go ahead and take a deep breath in and hold that breath. Now, without exhaling, try and take another breath on top of that. The difficulty and increased effort required to pull the next breath while the lungs are already expanded is similar to the discomfort patients with COPD feel in the midst of an acute exacerbation. So, how do we go about breaking the vicious cycle of a COPD or asthma exacerbation? The answer, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation includes both CPAP and BiPAP. Note, BiPAP is actually a brand name and the general term is bi-level positive airway pressure. In CPAP, a continuous positive pressure is delivered throughout the entirety of the respiratory cycle, for example, 5 centimeters of water. In BiPAP, both an inspiratory pressure, the IPAP, and an expiratory pressure, the EPAP, are set. At the bottom is a picture of non-invasive ventilation from 1995. On the right is a current image to show face masks that we utilize today. But why does non-invasive positive pressure ventilation help in the midst of a COPD exacerbation? On the screen, we are again showing the vicious cycle of a COPD or asthma exacerbation. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation stents open the obstructed airways. As these airways are stented open, they are allowed to empty during exhalation. Therefore, the lungs deflate and the diaphragm and chest wall return to a more normal and physiologic position. As these muscles of respiration return to their normal position, the patient could then take a larger breath with less effort. Again, recall the minute ventilation equation from earlier in the session. A larger breath or larger tidal volume will cause the PCO2 to decrease and the pH to increase. In addition, larger breaths with less effort reduce the respiratory rate and the patient's dyspnea. As long as the patient is wearing non-invasive, this cycle will continue while the inhaled bronchodilators and systemic steroids are allowed to work. Data supports the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for acute COPD exacerbations. One of the first landmark studies was from Burchard et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1995. In their trial, non-invasive was associated with a lower intubation rate, decreased length of stay, and lower mortality rate than standard care. How has this trial held up over the years? A Cochrane review in 2017 found that use of non-invasive in COPD exacerbations decreases mortality, reduces risk of intubation, and reduces length of hospital stay. The benefit of non-invasive in asthma is extrapolated from the aforementioned data in COPD. Another somewhat unexpected group of patients that benefit from non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. These patients have an alveolar filling process, water, and are not hypercapnic. Why then do they benefit from non-invasive? Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and positive pressure in general, increases intrathoracic pressure, 
Increased intrathoracic pressure decreases venous return to the heart and therefore decreases preload. Second, positive pressure decreases afterload and thereby improves forward flow. How does it do this? There are multiple components of cardiac afterload, one of which is the transmural pressure of the left ventricle. The transmural pressure is the pressure that the left ventricle must generate in order to eject the stroke volume. The transmural pressure is the difference between the left ventricular systolic pressure, the pressure inside the LV, and the pleural or intrathoracic pressure, the pressure outside the LV. Normal inspiration produces negative intrathoracic pressure, or negative pressure across the pleura and throughout the thoracic cavity. Therefore, during normal inspiration, the transmural pressure will equal the systolic blood pressure minus a negative intrathoracic pressure. Therefore, for a normal person, this will produce a higher transmural pressure. Basically, the heart has to overcome a force that is trying to pull the left ventricular walls outward, the negative intrathoracic pressure. When positive pressure is applied, the transmural pressure, and therefore the afterload, is decreased because you are now subtracting a positive pressure. Therefore, the LV no longer has to overcome an additional negative pressure, but rather is assisted in its mission by the inward positive pressure of positive pressure ventilation. A simplistic way to think about this, positive pressure provides an extra push during systole to help get blood out of the heart. Finally, positive pressure pushes fluid within the alveoli back into the interstitium where it can be cleared. You're about to put your patient on non-invasive for acute hypercapnic respiratory failure or acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. What are some things you always need to think about before putting the mask on their face? What are the major contraindications to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? Things to consider include whether there are copious oral secretions, as positive pressure could lead to aspiration and worsen their respiratory distress, altered mental status, inability to protect the airway, facial trauma, and hemodynamic instability or shock. Note that the majority of these contraindications deal with the CNS, head, and neck. So, Patients with COPD and asthma exacerbations, as well as acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, benefit from non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Once your patient is placed on non-invasive, you know they are getting better because their respiratory rate and dyspnea improve and their PCO2 decreases. But what if they get worse? The next step is intubation and mechanical ventilation. It is easiest to think about indications for intubation in a head-to-toe fashion. For the head and central nervous system, Alter mental status in an unprotected airway are indications for intubation, as well as copious secretions, airway edema, and burns or smoke inhalation. Cardiac indications include cardiac arrest and cardiogenic pulmonary edema that has failed non-invasive. Pulmonary indications include failure of NIPPV or heat of high flow nasal cannula, ARDS, and massive hemoptysis. GI indications include massive hematemesis or facilitation of a procedure like an EGD. And total body indications include shock. Shock represents type 4 respiratory failure. Why intubate for shock? While in shock, a patient's respiratory system will be unable to meet the metabolic demands of the body. The ability to control a patient's ventilation allows for both improved management of metabolic acidosis and to minimize the work of the respiratory musculature and decrease the proportion of the cardiac output consumed. The patient is now intubated and receiving mechanical ventilation. On the right is an image of the Hamilton ventilator interface. While a patient is on the ventilator, we can control both the oxygenation, the PaO2, and the ventilation, the pH and PaCO2. What four major variables allow us to affect these numbers? The variables that control oxygenation are the FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen, and the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure. The variables that control ventilation are the components of the minute ventilation equation referenced throughout this session, the tidal volume, and the respiratory rate. In this session, we defined hypoxemic and hypercapnic respiratory failure and created a differential for each form of respiratory distress. We then identified patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure, namely COPD and asthma exacerbations, plus acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema that benefit from non-invasive. We then briefly discussed indications for intubation and mechanical ventilation, and finally, what four major variables we can control on the ventilator and how they relate to oxygenation and ventilation. Thank you for your participation.